brief overview of conservation issues affecting corroborative frogs and uh, I think I can use this card. and some of the recovery actions we've been doing for the species. There are actually two species of closely, closely related corroborative frogs, the northern corroborative frogs, which we have in the ACT and they occur just over the border in New South Wales. There's also the southern corroborative frog which occurs in New South Wales down around um, Kosciuszko National Park. And let's see if this works. Meant to be working. No. Let me do this. So both species um, are only found in the higher elevation areas of the Australian Alps, um, and within that high elevation zone, they're only found where there are sphagnum moss bogs or other wet seepage areas, which are used as breeding habitat in summer. And those um, habitats are quite uncommon in that landscape. So corby frogs have a very patchy distribution, but where there are bogs. Um, historically, corroboree frogs were once quite abundant, so um, there's accounts of some of the larger bogs having, in summertime, uh, breeding aggregations of many hundreds, if not many thousands, of corroboree frogs. But by about the 1980s, the early 1980s, there were concerns raised that perhaps the abundance of corroboree frogs was not as much as it used to be. So New South Wales Parks began surveys for southern corroboree frogs, and we began surveys for um, the northern corroboree frog up in the Brenda Bellas. And the way we survey them is to walk across the bogs in a line, we stop at every pool we find, and we make a loud noise, usually a shout, we usually say, hey frog, um, or clap our hands. And the male corroboree frogs, when they hear a loud sound, respond back with a threat call. So that enables us to actually count the numbers calling males in the bogs. And that gives us an index of population sizes of the sites. So you can see from this graph, which is from one of the main breeding sites up, up in um, Janini Flats, um, this is the number of calling males. And way back in the 80s, Will Osborne, many of you probably know, um, counted at least 500 calling males. Six years later, they are down to about 10 calling males. So crabby frogs indeed were undergoing a massive population decline at the time. And you can see the population has, has not recovered. So in 1996, we began monitoring other key crabby frog sites. So this is this area in grey. And the next slide I'm, I'll show you is of the data from those other sites. And it's all the data is around about there. So I'm going to zoom in on that, bearing in mind we've already gone through this massive population crash at that site. So here's the data from the other sites. So each coloured line is a different site. Two things to notice from this. One is that it's all declining. And the second thing is, it shows a very similar pattern of decline. In fact, all these other sites are mirroring what happened at Janini West. So that tells us a couple of things. It tells us that the other sites probably went, underwent a massive decline, like Janini West did, and also that this decline is broad scale happening across the landscape. And in fact, the same thing was happening with southern crabby frogs down in Kosciuszko National Park. You'll see what looks like a bit of an increase in numbers at the end there. That's due to our reintroduction program of crabby frogs back to Namaji Park National Park, and I'll uh, talk about that in a moment. So at the time, we didn't know what was causing this decline. Uh, was it uh, UV from the ozone hole? Was it drought? Was it pesticides? Was it some mysterious disease? We had no idea. We now know it's the introduced amphibian chytrid fungus. It came into Australia in about the mid-70s. We know that by going back through museum skins of, of uh, specimens of frogs, looking at their skins. Um, and it spread around the world and caused uh, massive declines and in some cases extinctions of frogs. And we've lost a couple of species in Australia as well. So the picture is complicated by the fact that chytrid fungus doesn't affect all frogs the same. So some frogs are really susceptible to the disease, unlike crabbing frogs, and some frogs are quite resistant to the disease, like this guy. So this is the common eastern froglet. It's a habitat generalist. It occurs from basically the coast up to the summit of Coty. It's very common in the bogs where crabbing frogs are found. It carries the disease, doesn't appear to be affected by it, but everything it bumps into or jumps into a pool with gets chytrid fungus. Um, so it's been dubbed the typhoid mary of the chytrid fungus world. It carries the disease, passes it on, but shows no outward signs of it. So what that means is that even if there's no crabby fox left in the box, there is still a reservoir or a host of chytrid fungus. So chytrid fungus is basically in the environment and to stay with us. 
So just rewinding now back to the situation in 2002, this is the monitoring data we had. We, we had monitoring data up to here, and in 2002, things were not looking good for Corby Fox, so we decided that we needed to do something about this and something quick, and uh, that meant establishing a captive population in case the species went extinct in the wild as a safeguard. So we planned to go up the next year in 2003, in the middle of the breeding season, which is February for Corby Fox, and collect some eggs and take them back into captivity. But of course, January 2003, wildfires went through the Magic National Park. Most of the Magic looked like that. And if you were around in camera at the time, you, you'll know all about this. The bogs looked like that. So this occurred right in the middle of the breeding season. Um, all bogs in the Magic were burnt, and they were burnt. The, the amount they were burnt varied from about 80% to 100%. But fortunately, there were a few patches that didn't burn. Um, this is the late Peter Orme, who used to work with us, and he's looking at a, a state that is marking a pool that was used by Crobby Fox to breed the previous year. So there some, were some unburnt patches, and we went and looked through those, and fortunately, we did find some Crobby Frog eggs. So these are Crobby Frog eggs. They are about the size of a pea. Crobby Fox laid them out of water in the vegetation surrounding pools, and when those pools flood, the tadpoles wriggle into them. Um, the female only lays about 25 eggs, and they're really concentrated little capsules, and then they swell up with water, and a clutch of crabby frog eggs can be many times the size of the female that laid it. To see a female sitting on this massive clutch and think it came from her, it's quite a strange thing. The other thing is crabby frogs only lay about 25 eggs a year. Most frogs lay about 100. Cane toads lay up to 20,000. So crabby frogs have a very low reproductive output. So we went and collected about a third of each clutch that we found, um, we did want to collect every egg, just in case it had a dramatic effect on the population, but we knew most of these eggs wouldn't survive. So we collected about a third of the eggs in each clutch, and we put them into a biosecure facility out at Tipton Villa, specially set up for Robbie Fox, basically modified shipping containers. The planets must have aligned um, for us when we established this population. Hello, uh, this population, because there was two key things that happened that were really in our favour. The first was, we started collecting eggs in 2003 and 2004, and we collected a few hundred eggs. By 2005, there were too few crabby fox up in the bogs and too few eggs to be able to establish a captive population. So we just caught the end of that window um, to establish the population. The other lucky thing that happened was that crabby frog eggs don't have chytric fungus. We didn't know what was causing the decline at the time, but we just brought in eggs into captivity. Chytrid fungus needs keratin, which is in your nails and in your hair. It's in the skin of corroboree frogs and it's in the teeth of tadpoles. So tadpoles and corroboree frogs carry chytrid fungus for the egg stone. If we brought tadpoles or frogs into the captive colony, we would have infected it with chytrid uh, fungus and it would have been doomed. But another fortuitous thing is we just brought the eggs in and luckily they are chytrid fungus free. And we didn't find out for a few years after that what was causing the decline. So we've been raising crabby frogs in captivity for over 15 years now. The captive population has between 500 and 1,000 individuals. Uh, we've been able to breed them in terrariums of um, damp sphagnum so we can continue this population in the long term. And we've actually sent um, frogs down to Hillsville Sanctuary, so we've got another second uh, captive insurance population down in Hillsville. So these are northern crabby frogs from the high elevation areas of the Bellas. So the habitat's recovered from the fire. It's looking pretty good these days. That's a, uh, one of the breeding pools, and I've actually got a, a, a nest that's flagged um, there, one of the few nests that we found um, post-2005. So in some ways, crabby frogs are, I, I guess, lucky. Uh, a lot of species, when they become threatened, it's due to loss of habitat. There's no chance for those species to go back out to the wild. For crabby frogs, they've still got abundant habitat in some of the most pristine and best protected places on the mainland. So if we can only come this to overcome this disease issue, things are looking probably okay for crabby frogs. So chytrid fungus is here to stay with us. We're not going to get rid of it from the environment. In fact, there is no organism that has been introduced to the Australian environment that's become established that we've ever got rid of, and chytrid fungus will be one of those, especially since it's got all these other frog species that act as reservoirs. So any, if we want frog, cobbery frogs or any other frog species to live in the environment, they're going to have to live with chytrid fungus. Now, 
There's at least two Australian frogs that have gone through a massive population, massive population declines, um, persisted with chytrid fungus at low levels, and then their populations are increasing again. They've still got chytrid fungus, but they're somehow coping with it. So it looks like they've developed some natural resistance to chytrid fungus. Um, so we don't know whether Corby frogs have the capacity to do this, but we think it's worth a try. I mean, this species and a lot of other frog species, we're, we're clutching at straws and we're basically trying anything. There's a whole lot of things going on in the lab. Um, there's a whole people looking at genetics and inoculations and vaccines and bacteria, genetically modified bacteria, putting on the back of frogs to try and fight chytrid fungus. We don't know if any of it will work. We're involved at Tippinbilla and the Acid Government with the fieldwork side, trying to get frogs back into the wild having breeding populations persisting there to allow them to have the chance to perhaps develop some resistance to chytrid fungus. So in 2011, we began an experimental program of reintroducing crappie frogs back to the Manchin National Park. And we've been releasing a couple of hundred frogs each year. And the initial questions we were interested in, can any of these frogs survive at all with chytrid fungus? Can they reach breeding age? And if they do reach breeding age, can they actually breed? Down the track are the bigger questions, the holy grail of can they actually develop some resistance to the disease? Every frog we've released so far, we've photographed its belly because they have unique belly patterns like a fingerprint. So we can actually catch a frog in the field and know which year we released it at. So here's the graph you've seen before. Here are our first releases in 2011. Now these frogs we released as juveniles. Crappie frogs are very slow growing. They take another few years to reach breeding age. Um, and so we had to, the only way we could find crappie frogs is to fall in the box breeding males. So we had to wait a few years before we knew whether or not any of these frogs would actually show up. And in 2015, we got the first spike of calling males. And not a, not a lot of males, but we know that some of them can make it through the breeding season, and we've ma managed to maintain a small breeding aggregation every year, every year since. And uh, the other nice thing was that we found a couple of clutches of eggs, so they have bred, and the eggs look perfect. Great, healthy tadpoles, all fertilised, really great. So what have we learned so far from our reintroductions of crabby frogs? We know they can survive three years to breeding age, although we know that most of them don't make it, so about less than 20% make it through those three years. So that loss is due to probably a combination of things. Natural mortality, or frogs have natural mortality out there, undoubtedly mortality from chytrid fungus, but also probably dispersal away from the site because these frogs move through the woodlands as well. We know they can, if they make it to breeding age, they can successfully breed. And crunching some numbers, we know that um, if we put out 200 juvenile crabby frogs every year, we can maintain a, a breeding aggregation of around 40 frogs out there. Okay. Um, and crunching the numbers, we can, it turns out that we can actually, if we hold our frogs back longer, we can actually um, increase the, the double or triple the size of that breeding aggregation. So, where to next? Well, one of the things we want to do is to re release more mature frogs so that we can really boost those breeding aggregations. One of the ways to do that is to have breed frogs in these outdoor tanks. So the outdoor ring tanks, New South Wales Parks have had some success with these, means we can expand the numbers of frogs we raise at the facility. The shipping containers we don't have much room in. But using this, we can start experimenting with some of those other release strategies about putting mature frogs out. So the other thing, and just winding up, last slide, the other thing we're entering into over the next few years is a major research project with ANU and the Threatened Species Hub, and that's to look at different ways of putting crappie frogs out in the wild to help them um, cope with chytrid fungus. And it could even mean moving crappie frogs out to the wild, putting them in places that they didn't naturally occur outside their range, places where perhaps don't favour chytrid fungus, but favour crappie frogs. So the next few years, um, in terms of the recovery of crappie frogs, I, I think it's going to be quite interesting and, and hopefully we'll come up with some useful things and be one more step um, down the track of getting crappie frogs out in the field. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary.
Oh, um, is there any questions? Don't sit oh. down. <laughs> Are there any questions for Murray around that? Go Nell. So Wollongong Uni is yeah, doing. Just repeat the question. Or just oh, uh, is that someone trying to look at the genetics of crop forest to identify resistant genes? Is that is that? Oh, yeah, CRISPR technology. Yeah, well, I don't know about CRISPR technology, but Wollongong Uni and, and other unions are looking at genetics of crop frogs and the interaction between the genetics of frogs and um, and chytrid fungus. It, it's really complicated because um, crop frogs and other frogs. You mentioned a, a frog is a lump where of meat in the environment, perfect for <laughs> per, perfect for getting infected with funguses and bacteria and everything, but they don't. And one of the reasons they don't is they've got a cocktail of um, proteins and bacteria on their back that are symbiotic with them that naturally fight um, funguses and, back, and, and bad bacteria and that. And we think it's probably the combination of that cocktail that makes some species more resistant and some less. So people are looking at all sorts of things, but Genetic work, yeah. CRISPR, I don't know. Go, John. John. Oh, I just wonder if they can, they don't know whether it's other competitive species or can they be Okay, so northerns and southerns are completely different species. They used to be thought to be the same species, but um, the species barrier is no longer the, the definitive thing that says is something a species or not. So in the old days, we used to say they couldn't breed together or they hybridised and produced something that was, wasn't fertile, like a mule, donkey, you know. If they were different species. These days, we know species can actually interbreed and produce fer fertile offspring, so that's no longer a, a, an absolute measure of species. But they're very closely related. We haven't ever tried to cross them, but I'm sure that they would, they would interbreed, no problems. Okay, we might leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Mary.